Hello folks and welcome back to English 306 and in this lecture we're really going to start getting our hands dirty uh, with rhetorical theory. We're going to dive into the Sell Now book, The Rhetoric of Popular Culture, and she's a, a fabulous writer, very, very clear. I know sometimes it seems complicated, uh, seems a bit hard to wrap your head around sometimes, but, but believe me, <laughs> compared to some of the other uh, books out there, this is just crystal clear. And if it's a little, I always just say, you know, if sometimes the first time you read something, it doesn't necessarily sink in. Uh, so that's why I do these uh, lectures for one thing. But uh, two, I think if you, you know, carefully read the chapter, obviously, and and uh, highlight the important stuff, go back and reread it a few times, it'll really help you. Uh, especially if you pay attention to the parts that she bolds, you know, puts in bold like ethics uh, there. Those are the key terms that'll keep coming up again, uh, again and again throughout the book, and that we really want to, uh, you know, use in our own essays and discussions. Uh, so this first lecture, we'll be talking about, again, what is popular culture? How do we define that thing? It can be a bit slippery sometimes. Uh, two, again, why is it important? Why is there a class like 306? What, what, what do we hope that you'll get out of this class? Why is it worth <laughs> the money and the time? And then very, very briefly, uh, we'll start talking about the rhetorical analysis, those four steps, uh, the key terms. Again, it's... Uh, it could be a bit intimidating, maybe, uh, so we want to uh, take baby steps today. Uh, let you look at a student sample, uh, so you have a you know an increasingly clear picture of the expectations for that assignment. Remember, the the two rhetorical essays are the two big projects for this course, so it's it's really really important that you start thinking about those uh, and asking questions. Frankly, you know, if there's any part of it that, that's confusing. But again, this is just today, just the introduction. <laughs> I don't expect anybody to be uh, able to walk away uh, from this PowerPoint today and feel like you can, you know, do this perfectly. You know, if you can, uh, great. But, you know, we've got the whole semester to talk, to, uh, talk more about these uh, rhetorical perspectives. Uh, anyway, just for now, uh, I wanted to start with this writing prompt. There will be uh, four of these today. Pretty quick. You know, I don't want you to write an essay here. Uh, really, this one is just, uh, you know, may may maybe a two or three sentences, but uh, <laughs> just kind of gets your uh, wheels turning. Uh, but take a moment or two to jot down a favorite movie, television program, song, cartoon, comic strip, and advertisement. Uh, and then beside each of those selections, so you could just do one, two, three, four, five, uh, six. Actually, I don't even care if you do all six. You know, just do three. Uh, so besides... Uh, you know, pick three of those that are your favorites, and then beside it, uh, try to write briefly just why is that a favorite of yours? Why is that your favorite TV show or favorite movie, whatever? Uh, and then she says that those reasons that you write down actually demonstrate the influential role that each one of those plays and how you interpret the world around you. Uh, so then the second part of this is to jot down a friend or family's favorite that you don't like. Uh, so maybe you have a significant other a sibling or whatever and they were really into this other show or other movie and you can't stand it so uh you don't have to tell me who it is you know and, and <laughs> trying to pry here uh i do want you though to do what she suggests here and think about the assumptions uh, that you make about that individual's beliefs attitudes and values because they like that other thing that, that you don't so i think this is a really useful and uh fun writing prompt so take a few minutes and do this and then come back All right, moving on. There'll be a lot of vocab uh, in this lecture, but it's not too bad. And it's, again, really important terms. So if you are taking notes, you know, I always just like writing stuff down, uh, even though I'm kind of a the digital dude. Uh, I do find it helpful to take out a pen, a pencil, write down the at least the words in bold here, because they will come up again and again. I like to be sure that I'm... Uh, you know, uh, savvy with the definitions. Uh, anyway, the key theme of the whole book, really the whole course, is, is here. So your beliefs about how you ought to believe and how you ought to behave are influenced by the popular culture you consume. So we just say uh, influence there. It's not like uh, uh, brainwashing or mind control. 
You know, it's not like you watch a commercial and you can't help yourself. You got to rush out and buy the product. It doesn't work that way. Uh, but it does have some kind of subtle influence that's, that's always working on you, or at least attempting to exert some kind of influence. So that, that's really the key. There's, uh, there's nothing that uh, innocent about it in terms of, like, there's nothing that's just pure entertainment. You know, everything uh, that we might put under this label is somehow or another uh, trying to influence you. Uh, another key word here is ethics. And that is just simply the principles about what is right and what is wrong. Uh, so people have what they call an ethical perspective about things. And you find that sometimes you might disagree with somebody about what's right and wrong. Some people, for example, what you eat, uh, what you consider to be proper or acceptable uh, to cook <laughs> and eat and enjoy <laughs> uh, might be fine according to your ethics. Uh, but you might have a friend who says, no, you shouldn't eat that or that that's wrong uh, uh just thinking off the top of my head here uh meat <laughs> uh, some people like uh to eat steak they, they have no problem with that uh other people though say that's unethical uh you know obviously i'm not in a position to uh judge <laughs> something like that uh it's not the point i mean the point is just simply to understand that what we mean by the term ethics so principles about what is right and wrong uh, and rhetoric, understanding rhetorical theory, rhetorical perspective, can help us understand how this process happens. So how these works of pop culture that we're consuming, they're influencing perhaps even our, our ethics, you know, what's right and wrong. Uh, that's being shaped somehow by these uh, pop culture artifacts. So we want to know how that process works and then uh, what we can do about it because you'll probably... Uh, Occasionally watch movies and shows or see advertisements and think that's, you know, that that's violates my my ethics. Uh, so we want to know, you know, how they're attempting to uh, change our minds about things. Or, you know, uh, how we might, you know, use these same techniques ourselves if we uh, want to, you know, be creative. Uh, okay, culture. Kind of a big word. It's hard to define. You know, if you take a sociology class or any kind of cultural studies class, you know, this it's not like there's just one definition of culture that everybody uses. But but this is about as good as any. Um, actually, this is what we're not meaning by culture in this class. So let me uh, back up a little bit. Uh, so there's a sense of culture uh, in the sense of um, are you culture? Right, or, or this person over here is very cultured, uh, high culture, fine arts. And I always think about this in terms of a class that has the word appreciation uh, as part of the class title. So if we have a class called something like music appreciation or opera appreciation, something like this. Uh, the ex assumption there, I think, is that you don't normally like opera or mu or this uh, sort of classical music uh, you might listen to this and be really bored by it. you know you might hear opera and think that sounds awful i would much rather listen to uh <laughs> you know fill in the blank <laughs> uh you know anything else but opera uh so that you almost need a class you know to try to convince you and like show you all to the basically uh make an argument as to why this uh these operas are are worthy of all this attention and veneration. So that that's the sense. And the idea is if you were really cultured, if you're really good and sophisticated, then you naturally appreciate these uh, finer things in life. Uh, so anyway, I'm just saying all this to say this is basically not what we mean in this class by culture. We're not really concerned about making you uh, more sophisticated in, in, in that sense as a more cultured uh, person. And I'm not knocking that, by the way. You know, I'm a you know, English professor, obviously, I like to read classical literature. Uh, I like Shakespeare, even though it's definitely not necessarily enjoyable uh, when you're trying to learn like, what the heck does this even mean, <laughs> uh, much less, uh, you know, finding it fun, uh, at least until you've developed some, uh, you know, some, some appreciation for it. So I'm not knocking that. It's just not really what we mean by, the, by that term in, in this course. Uh, so what we are talking about is the quote, everyday objects, actions, and events 
that influence people to believe and behave in certain ways. That, that's a pretty broad definition. There's you know, Think about all of the objects and actions and events in your life uh, that have some kind of influence on you. So we talked about TV shows, uh, songs. You know, when I think about when I, I'm thinking about when I was a kid, I was growing up watching uh, cartoons and watch uh, cartoons like G.I. Joe, a real American hero. <laughs> you know, that's kind of got kind of almost a patriotic theme, even in the uh, the theme song. Or like the Transformers are another one of my my favorites. And I love the the cars and the robots and the sort of space stuff and those things. And just a little kid, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, like, oh, that's a you know, this artifact of popular culture is a, you know, this event <laughs> wasn't applying rhetorical perspectives back then. I was just enjoying uh, the cartoons and yeah, sure, I'm sure that they did influence, influence me in all kinds of ways that probably I wasn't uh, aware of. Uh, I do remember a show called Chips. I think there was a movie made about this much later, but it's about these, uh, you know, man, I don't even remember much about the show other than there were, uh, Cops on motorcycles. I guess it was like state troopers on uh, motorcycles. And I had a, uh, I loved it so much, my parents bought me a little, uh, uh, one of those electrical scooter type things that looked like the uh, the, uh, the motorcycles had three wheels on it. <laughs> and I remember just riding that thing uh, all over the place and feeling like I was in, in chips, you know, one of the uh, police officers. And that was a lot of fun. So certainly, you know, of course you grow out of that thing. You say, well, I'm not a kid anymore. I don't just imitate stuff I characters I like on TV. You know, I'm a little bit older than that. I don't still write <laughs> that. Uh, you know, Chip's big wheel. Uh, but in a sense, you're still, whether you are aware of it or not, still being influenced by those things. You're like, what's cool? What's not cool? Uh, what's okay? What's not okay? Uh, we're still sort of subtly picking up these messages from the shows we like or the music we listen to. Uh, the novels that we read, comics, you know, whatever. It doesn't always work on us, uh, but nevertheless, you can see they're, they could have, you could at least see that they're trying to influence you in that way or that they're uh, maybe not aware of it, but it's still having uh, an influence. All right, anyway, to narrow this down a little bit, uh, we're just going to be talking about mediated popular culture. So there is a popular culture that's not mediated, you know, stuff you do with, with your friends, all sorts of, you know, stuff that's basically not on television or not filmed, not recorded in any any fashion. So we're just going to bracket that off, not really worry about that, and just focus in on the mediated popular culture. Uh, and by that, we're talking about the pop culture that's uh, done through a media channel. So it could be a video, could be a, a song, a movie, you know, some, some kind of medium is in, involved there. Okay, let's hit the second writing prompt then. Uh, so identify messages that have been sent to you so far today via media, friends, or observations. What beliefs or behaviors did they reinforce or challenge for you about what is appropriate or inappropriate, desirable or undesirable, good or bad, and why? Uh, so again, uh, you don't have to name any particular friends or whatever. That's not the point. Uh, you know, the point is just to be starting to think about some of these subtle messages we've been talking about uh, that are coming to you, and I guess in this case, either something that you watched, maybe you saw a YouTube clip a while ago, I, I don't know, or you got a text from a friend, and, and see if you can uh, identify in that message, as innocent as it may seem to be, uh, is there some subtle thing there about what's appropriate or inappropriate? Uh, just think about that a little while. It may not be obvious to you. Uh, just, again, just think about it. And write, something to, uh, write something down and come back. Okay, uh, a little bit more terminology, and uh, these are pretty simple, but we're talking about how pop culture communicates to us, and so now it gives us two basic terms or two uh, sort of big tools, I guess, that pop culture uses, the sign and the artifact, and you might recognize these if you've uh, ever studied linguistics, but a sign is simply something that makes you think of something else. Uh, so, I, you know, most people think about, say, a stop sign on the road. You say, well, that it's sort of like this, right? You see that when you see a stop sign, you don't think, oh, look, there's sort of this, 
you know, hexagonal or <laughs> whatever, the, uh, whatever the name of that shape is, and, and it's red. Oh, that's fun. No, you don't think that. You think, oh, I need to hit my foot on the brake and, and stop the uh, the car, right? So it makes you think of something else. It doesn't make you think of the sign itself. Uh, so you can imagine lots of stuff fits in this category of sign. Uh, she uses the example, it's kind of interesting, of her wedding ring. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I don't have one, but if I did, you know, I'd look at it and think, oh, uh, I actually lost mine <laughs> in a lake. <laughs> so even though I don't have it, I guess it's still kind of bringing to mind. Uh, uh, I was on a jet ski in a lake one time. I made the mistake of letting my younger brother drive the uh, jet ski. Bad idea. Uh, yeah, I fell in the water. <laughs> I got, whoosh, I didn't fall in. That's like, whoosh, I got just, you know, whoosh right off of the right off of that jet ski and lost my glasses, my, my ring, my phone, everything. Uh, somehow my, my wallet was intact, but everything was, was wet. Anyway, uh, that's what it makes me think of. Now, that's just because those are my experiences. Those are my memories. Obviously, that wouldn't, if you had a wedding ring, or if you do and you look at it, it's not going to bring to mind a jet ski. At least I hope not. <laughs> uh, instead, you'll have your own association so that's the big difference here that's sort of your own thing uh or this is what distinguishes the something like something that's an artifact from something that's not an artifact so let me just jump into that uh, so an artifact is a sign it's a type of sign but it's socially grounded uh, and by that she means it's not just again something that only applies to me like the jet ski but something that anybody in our society or culture looking at a wedding ring would would know about that ring. So if you see somebody with a wedding ring and it's on the you know the finger wedding <laughs> finger, <laughs> man. Okay, uh, you know what I'm trying to say, right? If it's if it's there, <laughs> uh, you know that person's uh, more more than likely married, right? Or at least they want to uh, seem to be married or something. Uh, there's a wedding ring. This is what wedding rings mean. We we've seen the wedding ceremonies. You know the part about with this ring you seal the <laughs> seal the deal. <laughs> Uh, so we all know sort of what a wedding ring means in that larger sense. It's not just that particular ring there, but the wedding ring as a sort of symbol, as a sign that everybody would recognize. And, you know, of course, you go to another culture, uh, another country, they might not have wedding rings. It might not be a thing. Uh, or if they do, it might not be the same. It might not be a diamond. It might be a ruby. You know, different color, a <laughs> different... Uh, Maybe even a different hand, different finger, who knows? Uh, but hopefully that's a little clear now about the sign, just something that reminds you of something else. But the artifact, it is a type of sign, but it's something that not just one person, but a whole group of people uh, would recognize that has some shared meaning uh, amongst that group. Uh, so that brings us to the idea of a cultural group. And you know, this isn't necessarily just a little group of... Uh, of friends, but some some kind of broader group that's a little more, um, uh, I guess, established uh, in a culture. Uh, some of these words are a little bit slippery, uh, but the idea here is that you uh, everybody is belonging, or everybody feels like they belong, or identifies uh, with not just one group, but a multiple set of uh, cultural groups and. Uh, this will be a little clearer when we get to the examples, but uh, the idea is if you, whatever group this is, we, we happen to be talking about at the moment, they share some characteristics, beliefs, and a value system. Uh, otherwise, it's not really a cultural group. Right? So to be a cultural group, it has to do these things, right? You're part of this group, you share some characteristics, beliefs, and value systems. Uh, and then they also have ideologies, which is a big term here. That's why it's in bold. Uh, an ideology is a cultural group's perceptions about the way things are and assumptions about what they ought to be. And she uses the example of pet owners, and she talks a little bit about if you own a pet and you consider yourself a pet owner, part of this cultural group, uh, then there's certain perceptions and assumptions you have about uh, pets and kids and having a pet's a good thing and so on. Uh, I use the example of... Uh, my good friend Ed, who is a a, a linguist, a mild-mannered linguist by day. <laughs> but on the weekends, he's on his Harley-Davidson motorcycle. <laughs> you 
he loves his Harleys. You know, he's got the. Uh, it's not enough just to have the. You can't just have a motorcycle to be one of these Harley uh, Davidson uh, people, right? He's, he, you have to have the a real Harley, and he's got you know all the leather with the branded merchandise, and he's I don't know what, <laughs> what all he's got, <laughs> but it's a big thing for. It's not just like he's got this motorcycle, and you know that that's fine. And it's like big a big part of his life is like wrapped up in this uh, Harley Davidson. Uh, community, you know, he lo he loves this stuff. It's it's, and a lot of stuff comes with it, right? There's characteristics you can sort of tell, you know, when somebody's a Harley person. I don't know, is there a term for them? I don't know, biker. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> uh, so these uh, Harley Davidson bikers, you know, they have characteristics, beliefs. They have their own terminologies for things, own, their own vocabulary. You know, they're when he uh, when I see him talking to other uh, bikers, I can't even really follow. The discussion. I mean, they're using like all kinds of technical language. I'm just sort of like, yeah, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Sounds neat. Uh, you know, and same thing with uh, uh, fans of certain sports. You know, I, I, I pretty much know football. You know, I pretty much know soccer, but uh, I'm not one of these, uh, you know, I'm not a, a fan in the <laughs> like some of my friends are. <laughs> You know, and some uh, you know, you might have some friends that are really into a certain sport, or really like a certain team, and it's like there's clothes that go with it. Uh, again, they know all about the the people on the teams, and and they get really worked up uh, about things. Um, and so this is basically what we're talking about here: these these different cultural groups and ideologies. And it's, it gets really fascinating. I'll just say this this last little like the ideology of the bikers again. It's like they believe certain things and this is stuff i have picked up from from ed like this the freedom you know of, of not have they call it a cage <laughs> like the, the a regular car <laughs> or truck they call it a cage that's kind of like an idea uh, that's uh they feel constrained restricted if they're in a car right on, on the bike it's like they're free it's it's about freedom it's about independence you know it's about all all of these sort of ideas uh, they go along with the uh, uh, the motorcycle. I don't want to. <laughs> hopefully, it's starting to get the idea of what I'm talking about here. I don't want to spend all day talking about Ed and his uh, Harley, uh, but that is the basic idea at work here. And if you start thinking about your own groups, maybe you don't care about Harleys. Fine. Uh, maybe it's something else. I I'll just give you one more example because I, I love this stuff. But uh, gamers, you know, this is another cultural group, right? And there's some people call. Uh, some people will say, "Well, you've got casual gamers, you've got hardcore gamers, and this and that." So they try to break it up into into smaller groups, and then you get into like, "Well, are you really a gamer? <laughs> you know, you 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 play a uh, oh I don't know uh, a Candy Crush a little bit on your mobile phone. Does that does that mean you're a gamer? You know, so they kind of get into this idea that well." You know, you might share some of the characteristics, but you're not really, you're not really on board. You're not completely in uh, inside the group because there's some other, uh, you know, beliefs and value systems you haven't quite embraced fully yet. So we'll get into that later on in the semester. That idea. All right. So ideologies are formed, reinforced, and sometimes reformed through something we call rhetoric. Uh, so what do we mean by rhetoric? Why can't you ever just use regular words? Uh, I don't know. Uh, rhetoric. Defined simply as messages designed to influence people or persuasive communication. So to be rhetorical, there has to be some intention behind it to try to change your mind about something. Or maybe just to reinforce the way you already believe uh, about something. So it could be something really simple, of him, like Harley's. Oh, I, you know, you look so good on that Harley. That's, a, that's such a cool bike. <laughs> now you could say that's kind of rhetorical in a sense, because uh, it is kind of influencing somebody, make them feel better about the, you know, uh, their purchase, I suppose, or their that group they're part of. And so it's kind of uh, persuasive in that sense. And the uh, so we're not just talking here about a Harley Davidson advertisement. You know, we're saying this, there's all sorts of rhetoric going on. That's a lot more subtle uh, than that. So a rhetorical argument, then, is a persuasive message 
designed to reinforce or challenge a taken for granted belief or behavior about what is good or bad. So I just gave you one uh, about the, uh, the bikers, right? This idea of a cage. So there's something wrong about you're just driving around in a regular uh, pickup truck because uh, you got you're not free <laughs> you're sort of caged in like it's much better to be free and independent uh, that's the taken uh, for granted belief that's how it ought to be you know according to that uh, ideology it's you shouldn't be sort of constrained and you know i've heard uh i'll give you another example i'm sorry to be picking on bikers so much um but the helmets uh, there's this big debate uh, amongst the uh, bikers about should you wear this helmet or not. And there's different laws in different states about whether it's required to wear a helmet. And, you know, talking to my friend, I, I don't necessarily want to <laughs> give his point of view. Who knows? <laughs> Might uh, blow back on him somehow. Let's just say uh, some of the bikers <coughs> uh, say, I don't want to wear a helmet. I shouldn't have to wear a helmet. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm accept, I accept the risk of driving around, you know, without a helmet on. Uh, uh, so that, in a sense, could be a rhetorical argument. And, and if you imagine there's a movie about bikers and they're shown not wearing helmets, uh, that could be challenging or, I guess, uh, reinforcing that taken for granted belief that, you know, if you've got this movie about bikers, nobody's wearing a helmet, that seems to suggest that it's okay, not, it's, it's fine not to wear a helmet. You know, on the other hand, if it's a movie, if it's like a, a little PSA <laughs> where some um, some uh, body's driving around on a bike, no helmet, they get into an accident, they, they get in a serious injury or, or die. <laughs> you say that kind of challenges that belief, right? It's kind of saying, well, maybe you should wear uh, a helmet because look at what happened to this, you know, uh, this guy. Uh, so I'm kind of simplifying this, but you know, that, that's the point, right? We're trying to make this very simple. Uh, later on, we can start complicating it, but that's what we're talking about. All right, another word, uh, another term, I should say, is uh, text. Uh, so this will come up again and again. What do we mean by text? doesn't necessarily mean uh, it's written. It could be, we could say, a, a movie or a song is a text. And we can say that because we're defining it as any set of interrelated signs and artifacts that contribute to a unified message. So remember we talked about those artifacts being signs that are socially grounded. Uh, so we're just kind of stepping up from that, saying if you put a whole bunch of those artifacts together, uh, then you've got a text. Okay, so why study this stuff? Well, you know, there's lots of reasons. Uh, one is to keep me in paychecks, but um, <laughs> another is that uh, it does have this, these impacts on us, and it's not always good. You know, when you really sit down and you start thinking about the kind of messages uh, that are being conveyed in some of these comics or books or shows or whatever, you might say, you might decide that's not a good message. You know, these are wrong-headed beliefs. Uh, we, not necessarily, it's not that we necessarily want to uh, delete them or, or whatever, but uh, we won't definitely want to make ourselves aware of, you know, how it's trying to uh, affect us. So he says, uh, pop culture persuades by empowering, by empowering and disempowering certain people and groups by conveying messages about which beliefs and behaviors are good or bad. Pop culture has the persuasive power to shape beliefs and behaviors. So a couple examples <clears throat> uh, here. One of my uh, former students uh, did not have... Uh, or I guess you'd say visual, visually impaired, you know, um, seeing eye dog, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and uh, a big fan of, or he had a seeing eye dog, just remember the dog because we always talk, talked about her, uh, but he was also a, probably still is a big fan of Daredevil on uh, Netflix, and, and we'd always talk about uh, Daredevil, and he uh, was just re was actually uh, in in one of my earlier 306 classes. Uh, this particular student, and I remember he would talk about just how good it made him feel to uh, watch Daredevil and you know and uh, you know I guess uh, have a role model. You know he actually wanted to uh, uh, imitate uh, the character. I think his name is Matt. Uh, nice name, Matthew Murdoch. 
can't believe I can't remember the name of Daredevil uh, off the top of my head. But but anyway, uh, it was very clear to me uh, that he was being influenced in a positive way, really, uh, by the show Daredevil because it was very empowering uh, for him. You know, it wasn't like uh, here's a character that can't see and is powerless and helpless. You know, it was like the exact opposite of that. You know, here's a character who can't see. Uh, actually does have some sort of superpowers. But anyway, uh, it was a very powerful central character. was really getting uh, things done in that show. It was a very positive, you know, experience for my, uh, my student, uh, that particular program. And I see this, you know, with a lot of, in a lot of other shows, including, of course, uh, uh, Fear of the Walking Dead there. So my point here is it's not always, and Cell now makes this point too, it's not like it's always a negative thing. You know, we, there's, of course, lots of very unfortunate stereotypes uh, that get dragged out you know, again and again in these uh, programs. Uh, but on the other hand, there are positive uh, messages as well, empowering uh, messages about pop culture. So it's really good to be uh, you know, a little savvier about these things and start picking out uh, oh, okay. Well, you know that, that's you know I understand now better now why I like that uh, that movie. You know, I'll give you another one uh, from my experience. A lot of English professors, <laughs> English teachers. Uh, there was a movie with Robin Williams back in the day uh, called Dead Poets Society. If you've ever you know, watched that one, but it made a lot of people uh, want to be teachers like or professors like uh, I guess he was a teacher. Uh, like Robin Williams, because it's such a sort of powerful performance, uh, you know, really empowering that role for uh, literature and, and poetry and uh, people who teach it in the classroom. And so anyway, obviously that shapes a lot of people. You know, just, uh, again, I don't want to dwell on negative uh, things, but, you know, there is a, the old joke. If you, if you uh, happen to take a criminal studies class or any, any class where there is uh, or forensics, Basically, any show that, <laughs> uh, you know, has a, a parallel, like a CSI or Dexter, you know, these, these kind of shows. So people watch uh, a show like Dexter, and they get this idea of what, you know, working in that field, like, I guess, of forensic science is like. <laughs> or uh, another one is Bones. You know, people watch Bones and think that that's what, uh, you know, what is she, a biologist, I guess, or I forget her a job title in that but you know of course it's it's kind of uh you know hollywood if you want to use the word magic fine you know, they use their magic not quite the reality uh, but it does kind of shape people's attitudes and beliefs about what that's life is like uh one of my favorite shows at the moment is called um, better call saul i think it's the most rhetorical show i've ever seen <laughs> uh, but it's got a portrayal in there of a uh, the legal world and lawyers and attorneys and whether it's accurate accurate or not <laughs> i don't know but it, you know definitely kind of shapes your your views of that uh, profession uh, okay anyway moving on uh, so she talks about pop culture having this persuasive power to reinforce taken for granted beliefs and behaviors uh, so a lot of people say that's just you know if we look at this old leave it to beaver show or i don't know if you ever watched uh, you know these old black and white sitcoms from the 50s i kind of grew up watching these uh but they're, you, call them, you might say those are very old-fashioned you know they're very uh antiquated you know another one's andy griffith you know this kind of show or even like old uh, star trek <laughs> shows it got kind of futuristic at the time but now you might say well that's that's uh really just uh, dredging up or it's reinforcing a lot of uh, beliefs and behaviors that we kind of moved on from thankfully you know, you know since this time I guess you look at a show like this today and think, well, that is really sort of uh, old-fashioned and conservative, uh, you, know, you know, in many ways. Not necessarily a bad thing for all audiences, right? There's a reason why these things are in syndication. They keep putting them into, into reruns. People still enjoy watching these. <laughs> uh, not the, I'm not sitting here saying it's right or wrong. Uh, I mean, my point is simply that they do uh, reinforce or challenge, you know, certain views that, some people just consider it to be common sense. I think that's the way everybody does it, not being aware that it's actually a, a choice uh, that people make. It's not true for all societies, all cultures everywhere. Uh, okay, um, moving on then to your rhetorical 
uh, rhetorical analysis steps. And she gives four basic steps here. And again, we're going to come back to this many times throughout the semester, so don't uh, get panicked if it's not immediately clear what you're supposed to do. That's fine. Uh, but the, the steps are to select text and formulate your question, research question. Uh, two, select one of the rhetorical perspectives. And again, we'll be dealing with those all semester. Uh, three, examine the text, and there's steps to that, description, in, uh, interpretation, and then finally, evaluation, evaluating the potential implications of the text. The uh, uh, so what question, we sometimes uh, use that for that, or exigence. Use a really fancy word. Okay, so when you're ready to do your rhetorical analysis, the first step is to either start with the question that you have, that you want to answer, or just start with the text, you know, the artifact that is curious for you or has piqued your interest somehow. doesn't really matter which one, but, you know, you have to do one or the other. Uh, but in either case, the first step, or the first goal, is try to come up with this proper research question. So what do you want to learn from this analysis? Why, uh, what do you hope to get out of doing this? Uh, so let's just uh, quickly do this in sort of a mini miniature form. So think about a TV show you like. Hey, why not do The Walking Dead? Uh, do whatever you like. Uh, which characters in that show are portrayed as normal? Which ones are depicted as different in some way? Not necessarily bad, just not normal, whatever that means. Uh, now identify the characteristics and behaviors of each as they serve to reinforce an ideology about how one ought to and ought not to believe or behave if one wants to be perceived by others as normal. Uh, so I'll give uh, a quick example here just to, in case you're confused by this question. In the first episode of The Walking Dead, Rick and Shane, his, uh, his buddy, his, his best friend, you know, they're both uh, police, or uh, I guess deputies, whatever the term is, uh, <laughs> cops. <laughs> and they're having this uh, discussion about women. And I would argue one of those, uh, I'm not going to tell you which one, just watch it. Uh, I, th I think you'll agree. One of the viewpoints is kind of the normal viewpoint. The other one is kind of abnormal. It's just a little weird. Uh, you know, you can tell there's just not quite right <laughs> about this other person's viewpoint. Uh, it's kind of, you know, different, I suppose you could say. Uh, one of them is, I think, what you're supposed to want to say is, is how you ought to be. Uh, the other one is saying that's how you shouldn't be. <laughs> you know, another quick example uh, is a show called Big Bang Theory. If you've ever seen that, it's, it's a pretty fun show. You know, I kind of got some problems with it. But uh, but anyway, there are certain characters I think we can all agree that are not considered bad. They're not, I don't know if any of the main characters you would call normal, per se, but maybe normal within that context. Or <laughs> Whereas others are just really... You know, you think they're, 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 you're always laughing because they're just behaving in such unexpected ways, right? They're not following uh, the script, per se. So you could get into how is that, is that reinforcing ideologies? Is it challenging them? Uh, anyway, take a few minutes to answer that about one of your favorite shows. Okay, the next step would be simply to choose a rhetorical uh, perspective. And we're going to have 12 total. There's... I think I put 10. I'm pretty sure there's 10, maybe 9 uh, in the Cell Now book. I'm not going to get into them now. Uh, but don't forget, we also have the transmedia perspective I covered last time, uh, as well as, uh, excuse me, McLeod. He's got a, a perspective that's built for uh, comic books. So you could use that, especially if you're talking about a uh, comic book. But anyway, a rhetorical perspective is, quote, uh, a lens through which you look to magnify the underlying messages that have to do with the question you're asking. Uh, so, for example, if you want to look at that discussion I was talking about with, between uh, Shane and, uh, and Rick uh, and The Walking Dead, I, there's a rhetorical perspective called the feminist perspective. And there's several different options within that. Uh, but I can pick up that perspective, and that will give me some terminology to use, some concepts, uh, some sources. Uh, will be mentioned there and I can use those to talk about that scene and you know step by step through the dialogue 
and see if I could figure out what are the messages being conveyed, uh, what's the behavior that's being presented as, how you ought to be, and which one is how you ought not to be, and so on and so forth. Uh, or I could choose a completely different perspective uh, and ask a completely different question. Right, so it's, it's up to you. Uh, there's many different ones to choose from, and each one will give you basically a different, uh, well, I guess lens is about as good of a term as, as any. I kind of compare it to, uh, say, being a, let's say you're a painter, and you really know a lot about painting and painting terminology, and you're a very skilled painter, and you go to the um, Monsinger Rose Gardens, you know, in peak season. Uh, and you're walking through that garden and you're seeing like all the colors and the textures and you know it's the fantastic uh, visual experience taking place there like the effects of the light and the shadow uh, you're going to have a very different perspective than say a, a chemist or uh, walking through there and thinking about um, you know maybe which which of these flowers might produce some type of useful medicine let's say or you know, think again about a botanist you know, think about all of the vocabulary and terminology that goes with being a, a botanist. You know, <laughs> stamens and, and pistils and you know, who, who knows what. And being able to, you know, identify very specific species and um, you know, orders and genuses. I, I don't know. Uh, but the point is those different sort of perspectives uh, will help them to focus on certain things versus other things. Like the, uh, the painter, for example, would probably be a lot more drawn to the, the appearance of the flowers, uh, whereas the, let's say, a biologist or the, uh, the botanist might be more interested in, uh, you know, going, going below the, the surface, you know, to think about maybe the relationships between those flowers and, and similar ones, or even like the microscopic level uh, of the flowers. <laughs> you know, hopefully that's making a little bit of sense. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, which tools you have in your tool belt when you show up at you know at the scene and uh, depending on the the tools you have available uh, that will to some extent determine or influence what you see uh, when you start doing your analysis so uh, again we'll get more into it but that's the basic idea uh, so that third step is broken into uh, three smaller steps uh, so you're describing the message so you don't want to assume that the reader of your essay has seen the program or listened to the song or seen the painting or whatever it is, uh, you have to describe it to them. And it's important because the way you describe things is uh, significant as well because, you know, you're, <laughs> by any kind of description, there's no neutral description. You're actually going to be uh, revealing a little bit of your own ideology by the way you describe something. And again, that's a pretty advanced idea. We'll, we'll get to it in more detail later. But just, you know, what do you see there? What is the taken-for-granted beliefs? And what's the behavior? What's the issue? Uh, and then interpret those messages. How are those messages being conveyed by applying your rhetorical perspective? So again, if we're doing the feminist perspective, we can go back, look at some of that terminology, start picking up uh, words like the uh, preferred reading, uh, the oppositional reading, and so on and so forth. Maybe heteronormativity might crop up in that analysis. That's a term uh, from that perspective. Uh, three, evaluate the significance of the argument you make about the text messages. Uh, in other words, uh, why does any of this matter? You know, you say, I'm going to do this rhetorical analysis of an episode of Big Bang Theory. Uh, so what? Why should anybody care about that? So you got to make some case as to why it's important. You know, one of the uh, obvious ones is if you say this is actually uh, arguing of a fairly negative value, or <laughs> I don't think people would really agree with the values this show is trying to uh, promote. You know, when you get a little, a little bit beneath the surface, uh, or you might say this is a uh, it's important because it's a very positive thing. You know, the, the show's got a very positive message. It'd be good if more uh, people watched the show and uh, adopted this set of uh, values. So that's just kind of off the top of my head, some examples. Uh, but again, we'll get much more into it. Uh, so to wrap up here, if you haven't done so already, take a close read of this uh, student essay. It's on page 16. Now, I will say, I, I don't think this is the best example to start off with because uh, Carol, I guess, uh, she's she uses a whole bunch of perspectives. I think maybe four different perspectives. 
uh, in this essay. So it's kind of overkill. You know, when I teach this class, I say, don't you don't need to use but one. Just use one, maybe two perspectives tops. You know, I don't know why so many were used here. Uh, but anyway, it's it still gives you a pretty good idea of, uh, you know, the stuff, the kind of stuff we're looking for. So read the essay and then consider what Carol offers as one, the moral of the story from a narrative perspective, two, justification for breaking society's rules for living uh, from a dramatistic perspective. You'll see she'll, she'll talk about narrative and then another part will be about Burke and uh, drama, dramatism, dramatistic perspective. So just see if you can pick up on that. Uh, three, a rationale for who ought to be empowered and why from a neo-Marxist perspective. And again, just look for those paragraphs that have something to do with uh, neo-Marxism and you'll you'll see uh, what she's getting at there. And then four, the appropriate roles and rules uh, for men and women uh, from a feminist perspective. So she's doing a whole lot in this essay, way more than you need to do, but you know, might as well <laughs> dive in. Uh, I think it's about uh, Into the Woods familiar with that. Uh, so based on the evidence she draws from the text to support her, her arguments, do you agree or disagree and why? So hopefully you're familiar with the show, but I don't know if it's necessarily important. You could just be looking at her argument and seeing if, if you think it's effective or not. So this, this will take a little bit of time. It'll be very useful for you uh, moving ahead. So go ahead and do that and then come back and we'll finish up. Okay, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I know it's a lot of uh, technical material, but hopefully it wasn't too bad. And again, if you have any questions, uh, you can certainly feel free to ask those. And again, we'll be coming back to these topics throughout the semester. So, you know, just uh, hold tight. I'm sure we'll uh, clear things up as we move along. But anyway, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.